Hello and welcome to this special edition of Beyond the Podium. I'm Chris Daniels. This is all about the race for governor and the four candidates who want your vote in 2024. For the next hour, commercial free, we will introduce you to the candidates who have raised the most money in the campaign to be the state's top executive. Attorney General Bob Ferguson, former Congressman and King County Sheriff Dave Reichert, former Richland School Board member Sammy Byrd, and State Senator Mark Mullet. Two Democrats, two Republicans, all looking to make it into the top two in the August primary election. You will hear from each in extended sit-down conversations about issues ranging from homelessness, addiction, campaigning with Donald Trump, and what may be a key issue for a lot of voters in this cycle, abortion. Let's begin with Riker, who has been trying to run as a moderate and become the first Republican governor in Washington state in four decades. Kick that governor's door down. In the middle of the state. The people on the extreme sides, their whole job is to spread fear and spread lies. Dave Reichert is honing his stump speech about middle ground. I'm not an ideologue. Hammering home his resume. We gotta get them into a, a facility. As a King County Sheriff. The lowest per capita coverage. And seven term congressman. Are you enjoying campaigning? I mean, I've heard that you don't really enjoy this part of it all. The campaign. Well, who told you that? <laughs> I think that's funny. <laughs> the only part that I that I don't appreciate is the fundraising part. Yet he's raised the most of any Republican gubernatorial candidates. What are the four things you want to fix in 2024? The criminal justice system in total, uh, homelessness, and then third is the economy, which most people relate to high taxes continually uh, piling on taxes. Fourth is education. When we last spoke, we talked about homelessness. You had even talked about building a bunch of shelters on McNeil Island. Do you still believe that's a viable solution? The point of that, that um, example was to give you an idea that for me, everything is on the table. When somebody accuses you of being extreme on that position, the idea of shipping people to an island, you would say what? Well, I don't, I don't think any idea right now is should be off the table. The 73 year old has been pushed for years by moderate GOP backers to do this. We need to enforce the laws. Despite the math that has been a party problem for years in King County. I've talked to consultants who who talk about this all the time, how tough it is for a Republican to get 40 percent of the vote. Donald Trump lost 74 to 22 and 730,000 votes in the last election. Inslee won by nearly 550,000 votes. Why are you the guy to yeah. get over the 40 mark well, in King I, County? Because I've never, take, I've never taken the butt kicking <laughs> that everybody else has taken. So when Obama ran, I won both times. Would you campaign for Donald Trump or uh, would you campaign alongside him? Well, the one thing I'm not going to do is let um, the national politics drive what's happening here in Washington state. That sounds like a no. You can read that any way you want to. But polling suggests abortion may be the overriding issue for many voters in 24. Reichert, who is pro-life, has been working on that messaging too. Would you support a federal ban on abortion? No, I'm again focused on Washington state. Supreme Court has already decided this issue. This is a state's rights issue. You wouldn't try to do anything as governor to change abortion no, laws in Washington state? No, nope, I don't think any politician should be working toward any agenda when it comes to abortion in Washington state. I remember one of the ads, Dave Reichert, dangerous for America. Will voters believe him? Every year I see an increase um, in the homeless community. With that increase, I also worry for like my safety. Lucy Villa runs a Wenatchee Latino gift shop and clothing store and met with Riker. What you're telling me is homelessness is not just a Seattle problem. No, um, it has been increasing here in Wenatchee. If he's going to address that matter, I would vote for him. I am a lifelong Democrat. Beth Hancock moved from the west side of the mountains to central Washington. So as a lifelong Democrat, given all the polarization mm -hmm. in the country, why now to vote for a Republican governor in Washington state? Because I think so many things have gone wrong in our state. Crime, taxes, our schools. You know, I think it just takes somebody with common sense and a voice of reason that listens to the middle. Reichert is banking that other middle roaders will also agree here in the center and throughout a state that hasn't been led by a Republican now in 40 years. Let's win. 
You'll hear more from Reichert in a bit. He's been running neck and neck in most early polling with Bob Ferguson. The attorney general has telegraphed this campaign for years and is already sharpening a message for November. And the weather's turning for us just in time. At a recent Seattle shrimp feed. The law was passed like in 1942. Democrat Bob Ferguson is already campaigning. Quick picture. Like he's one of the big fish in the gubernatorial pond. I've never lost an election and I don't plan on starting this year. And you're gonna have a choice in November and the choice you're gonna have is me, the real Bob Ferguson, <laughs> versus former Congressman Dave Reichert. That's gonna be your choice. Bob, it feels like you've been running for governor for a decade. Why now? It's only been a year. <laughs> it's only been a year. But the three-term attorney general is the leading fundraiser of any candidate. What are your four top priorities in 24? Public safety. Number two, homelessness. We need to be investing in more housing. One more I'll add is, I think as a state, we need to be prepared for the potential of the Donald Trump presidency. And we'll need to have a governor who stands up for the rights of all Washingtonians. I think what we need as a governor is a change agent. So what's the big idea? How do you fix homelessness? As a governor, we need to make sure we're working to address the underlying causes of homelessness. Look, Dave Reichert, he has said he would take the unhoused and send them to McNeil Island. That's where we keep our sexually violent predators. I'm sorry, that is not a serious solution to an issue as serious as homelessness. What we need are investments that are smart, that get folks in temporary housing, get them off the streets, get them the wraparound services. You wanted to decriminalize drugs in 2021. You wanted to eliminate the criminal penalties for non-commercial possession. Oregon did it. Yep. It was chaotic. Yep. Do you still believe that Washington should do it? Oh no, look, I long ago said that should not be our approach and there are lessons we learned from that. So you do not want to decriminalize drugs anymore? I support the legislature's actions long ago. Yet that issue of public safety will likely dominate the debate. <laughs> And regarding leadership on disruptive events, like when a governor should get involved with clearing public obstructions or roadways, as seen in Seattle in recent weeks. If you're governor, when do you get involved in that? Well, let's take the freeway, for example. We're recall seeing a photograph of that protest where there was an emergency vehicle that was stopped in its tracks because of the protest. So as a governor, you're involved in me on something like that. Uh, utilizing the powers you have with state troopers as appropriate. Would you have encouraged the, the University of Washington president to do something earlier than she did? I think it's easy to second guess somebody who's facing a very, very challenging situation with the vandalism to the hub or, you know, I was a student and to buildings. That's unacceptable. Ferguson is promising to grant $100 million to local law enforcement, tweak the Climate Act to lower gas prices, and fix the ferry system, stopping short of offering specific timelines for immediate improvement. I think most people can realize, wait a second, constructing a ferry might take some time, okay? And we've got a crisis, that might take a little time. What do you think the biggest issue is right now in the state of Washington? Uh, I think there's too many. Joan Paulson of Seattle says she does not believe Ferguson represents status quo. Logical, sensible, and driven. You say you're a change agent, you said it multiple times. Yeah. You know, there are people who uh, will argue that it's a continuation of the Inslee administration uh, if yeah. you're elected. I think all folks have to do is look at my record. First lawsuit I filed against the president was not Donald Trump, it was Barack Obama. It was on behalf of workers in central Washington, and we won that case. So I've not been shy on taking on my party here locally. And you're the only Bob Ferguson now running. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Voters will have their say before the next annual shrimp feed. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Ferguson has been attacked on the left by state senator and Democrat Mark Mullet. In fact, Mullet has been attempting to carve a path involving disenfranchised Democrats and independents and may even connect with a few Republicans. I sat down with Mullet at his Issaquah ice cream shop to ask how he feels he's different than the rest. Mark, what does this store have to do with you running for governor? <laughs> this, this is my ice cream store. All my kids have worked here. The youngest of our six kids, Penelope, will actually start here uh, this summer, but it's been nice from that aspect, but this is where you can get signs. So we tell our campaign supporters, Ben and Jerry's open every day from noon to nine in Issaquah, and if you want a sign, come by, and we have signs here, and, and it's better than them knocking on the door of my house at random hours, so it works out really nice. How does this frame your perspective on, on running for the highest office in the state? My common thread when I go to an annual meeting for Ben and Jerry's with other 
franchise owners. The common thread is we all hate wasting money. Like small business owners just simply can't afford to waste money. And I think that's the mentality we need in the governor's office is this mentality that we're going to quit wasting money. And I think when you have that perspective, our state agencies will be a lot more productive and we can actually get more stuff done with our current tax dollars as opposed to asking for more tax dollars. So what are your top four priorities as you run for governor? First one is affordability. We have to figure out how to make our state affordable. Like I'm at the point in my life where our oldest daughter's a junior up at Western and Bellingham and she finishes school next year and my wife and I have anxiety. She can actually afford to live here. The second focus for me is, is really around public safety, like being intellectually honest about the things where we have to do better as Democrats and public safety is top of that list. And the state can be a better financial partner with cities and counties and the public safety front. The third comes back to jobs. Like this is why I think it's nice to be a small business owner. Like I look at the vacancy rate in downtown Seattle right now of office buildings. We're gonna want a governor that can actually go in and recruit businesses to come to our state. And I think it's hard to do that if you have a track record of suing businesses. I think I can be successful at doing that because I have a track record of supporting the business community. And the final one is our public schools. You know, all my wife's an elementary school teacher in Issaquah. All six of our kids have gone through the public school system here. The public school system has to work. Like it has to be top notch. I think there's a lot of room for improvement still. We've, we've thrown billions of dollars in the public school system. Now it's actually making sure we're getting results for all that money we've invested, and that's why I think we need a change in leadership. How do you fix public safety? You're, one of your opponents, Bob Ferguson, is saying $100 million, and we'll hire a bunch of people, and we'll do all these things. How, <laughs> how do you fix public safety? So I spent a lot of time focusing on our cannabis tax revenue. We get roughly $480 million a year in cannabis tax revenue. I think we should be pushing that out at the local level to both cities and counties, and, and I'm a big fan of secure substance abuse treatment facilities. Like I think that's our missing link right now in the state of Washington is our substance abuse treatment facilities. The front door is always open. I think if you're using drugs in public, I don't want you to go to jail for a year, but I do want you to get treatment and I don't want the front door of that facility to be open. I want it to be locked so you're in there for 30 or 45 or 60 days. I want you to have the best chance possible to actually beat your addiction. And I think the state steps up financially to make sure we have that option you will start to see huge improvements on the public safety front all across our state. You've been in the legislature, why hasn't that happened? You know, the, the governor has a lot of power, and so he has his priorities right now of where he wants to spend his money. My priorities would be different, and I think that's what's really important is you have to get both the House, the Senate, and the governor's office to sign off. The veto pen is very powerful, and, and Governor Ensley is, has made it very clear where his priorities are, and that hasn't been on the public safety front. It, it doesn't seem like uh, anybody who's been running for office uh, and the current governor has really put transportation at the top. There's been polling, and you know this, uh, every year at the start of the legislative session about what's the biggest issue for people. Five, six years ago, it was transportation. Now it's f further down the list. Homelessness is uh, the top issue for a lot of voters. But in terms of transportation, there is an issue with the ferry system where the ferry leaders and elected leaders say there is going to be no quick fix, that it's going to be a problem for a few years. For a lot of people, that's not good enough. How do you fix the ferry system if you're governor? This is where I have been critical of, of Governor Ensley. I feel like he was the one demanding that we switch from our traditional ferries to hybrid electric, which I think would have been fine if Vigor, the local shipyard that was building our ferries, could have done it. But once we realized that Vigor wasn't able to do that, I really wish Governor Ensley had pivoted to say, okay, well, let's right size the fleet first. That's the key. And in terms of now, if you're looking at taking existing ferries and making them hybrid electric, like I would put a pause button on trying to convert any existing ferry to hybrid electric until we have additional boats in the water. And to me, I've been very clear my entire time, you can't, uh, please, I drive an electric car to and from Olympia. I know climate change is real. I believe in it, but I also talk to people who live and rely upon our ferry system and it's not fair for them to miss their doctor appointments because we don't have boats in the water and if, if it's quicker to get diesel boats in the water then let's do the diesel boats. I know Governor Ensley right now feels that based on the current state we can't get them any quicker than 2028 and if that ends up being the case like you have to at least get the staffing right. You have to make sure that you have enough redundant staffing so you're never canceling any routes because somebody calls off work. That's been a problem as well. You can't hire people fast enough to staff these things. How do you change that? Once again, this is what I think makes me different than, than Bob Ferguson. I've been pretty open 
you know, of saying, hey, during the pandemic, as a senator, I was allowed to go to work every day by taking a COVID test to prove I was negative. I took one on Monday, I took one on Thursday. I was really frustrated during the pandemic. I felt we could have done the exact same thing for our ferry workers to said, hey, they're essential workers to make sure this works. And as long as they're willing to take a test twice a week to prove they're negative, they shouldn't have been fired. And so I think we've created a lot of our own misery here based on decisions made in the governor's office. This is why I'm running. We need a change in how we make decisions in the governor's office if we want our state to work better. So you think those staffing issues are still related to what happened in 2020, 2021? We're still digging ourselves out of this hole. It was a hole we didn't have to be in. Like it was a hole that was created by Governor Enzi because he refused to let people test. He did the mandate and we ended up losing a lot of staff that we haven't been able to replace. As far as electric vehicles, since you said you, you drive one, uh, the, the governor just had a press conference last week about further incentives for EVs and trying to get more people to buy them. It seems like though consumers have kind of plateaued on their interest with, with buying electric vehicles right now. What more can possibly be done to encourage people to jump in to an electric vehicle given that we know there's issues with charge anxiety and, and battery anxiety? The more charging stations, the better. And they have to be the ones where you can charge quickly. So I think the more the state invests where you can just get off basically at every freeway exit and feel like most freeway exits, you know you can probably fill up your gas tank. We need to get to that same level of reliability where pretty much every freeway exit, you know there's going to be a charging station there where you can charge your car in a reasonable amount of time. Like we're talking like 30, 45 minutes. And so to me, there is room for improvement there. I think. I think I'm a little bit more open-minded to the fact that hybrids, especially plug-in hybrids, are probably going to be part of this transition. And I think we just have to kind of embrace everything. We can't just say it all has to be 100% electric. I think the plug-in hybrid is actually a really good option where you're on battery for that first 40 or 50 miles and, and then you transition to gas and that enables people to still do long road trips, but they're really not hurting the environment in their daily commute. But as far as hurting the environment, a lot of talk about the Climate Act. You're on record on uh, the three initiatives that are going to be on the ballot in November. You would vote for them, including repealing. No, I, my record lines up exactly with how I voted in the Senate, which is I opposed the long-term care payroll tax, never thought it was a good tax, never thought our state could afford it. I was really frustrated. I voted against the capital gains tax because we had the largest budget surplus in the history of our state, $8 billion. And I said, I will support the capital gains tax if we're going to reduce another tax. Like if we were going to take away sales tax on clothing, that was interesting to me. If we we're going to lower property taxes, that was interesting to me. The Climate Commitment Act is the one initiative that I'm not supporting. I, and the reason is really important. The governor's office has been given tremendous authority of where the price of gas is with the Climate Commitment Act. And this has been my super vocal frustration with Governor Inslee is he's taken these climate auctions and he has one goal drive up the price of the auctions as high as possible to get as much money in the door as he can. That money is coming from the people who can least afford to pay it. That's from a person who has to live in Puyallup because that's the only place they can afford and then drives an hour to work in Seattle. As governor, I will have the exact opposite of approach. Like I know as the chair of the capital budget, we can fight climate change without having the highest gas prices in the country. My focus as governor is make sure the climate auctions are as low as possible so we still have money coming in to fight climate change, but we're not making it unaffordable for average working families to stay and live here. So to clarify, you're not voting for the, the repeal of that act? I'm not on the Climate Commitment Act, no. But if you're elected governor, you would be interested in doing something different with that Completely act. different. And I've actually dropped bills to propose what I would do. Of course, Governor Enzi said he would veto that because he doesn't have any interest and having a more balanced approach in terms of, you know, I think it's a false choice to say anyone complaining about the price of gas doesn't care about climate change. I know a lot of people that care about climate change, but also care about the price of gas. And that's the balance we need to get right. We need to get away from this all or nothing approach that we've seen from the current administration, go back to something more balanced. So you're clearly trying to carve out this middle lane. We talked with Dave Reichert as well, who's trying to carve out a middle lane. Are there enough Democrats who are willing to drive down this to, to continue on with this metaphor about driving. <laughs> are, are there enough Democrats do you think are willing to drive down this, this middle lane? There's a lot of Democrats. I mean, you've seen it in every poll, I think. Two thirds of the state wants somebody besides Bob Ferguson. And, and the winner of every poll right now is the undecided. So I don't know where that candidate is right now, but that's why we're optimistic. And you know, you're right, I am proud to be a moderate in this race, but that's the thing. It's like on the Republican side, if 
I mean, if you're anti-choice and you're not supporting marriage equality, you're not a moderate. I mean, that's the simple reality. You're not a moderate in the state of Washington when you're on the wrong side of those issues. And I've been on the right side of women's reproductive rights, the right side of marriage equality, my entire time in public office in the state of Washington. And that's why I say, yes, I don't vote for unnecessary tax increases, but when it comes to those social values that are so important to the majority of Washington residents, I have a proven track record of being on the right side of those issues and fighting for those issues. I have four daughters here. I never do anything to take away women's reproductive rights. I want them you know, to have that choice their entire life, but I also acknowledge that women's reproductive rights aren't great for my daughters. They can't afford to live in the state where my wife and I were both born and raised. You know, This is the balance we have to get right save those social values, but make our state affordable, invest in public safety so our state is also safe. Dave Reichert, again, trying to occupy this middle lane, has said that in his mind, abortion has already been decided by the voters of Washington State, that there's nothing that he could do as a governor to change abortion laws in Washington State. Do you believe that to be the case as somebody who could be elected governor, that there's, there's nothing you could do to change the law in Washington State? So this is the analogy I always used, I like to make, is think about Idaho. Do you think someone in Idaho is gonna be elected governor of Idaho if they are opposed to the Second Amendment? The answer is no. They will never be elected governor of Idaho if they're opposed to the Second Amendment. It's not because as governor they could undo anything, it's because people don't wanna vote for someone as governor who has the wrong side of a value that they care deeply about. And this is what I think Dave Reichert is not understanding. You could say in Idaho the exact same thing. Oh, it doesn't matter they want to get rid of the Second Amendment. The legislature will never let them do that. That's not the point. The point is when your values don't line up with the majority of voters, you can't get elected in the state of Washington. You can't get elected in any state for that matter when that's the case. And, and that's why I think it really matters to have a candidate whose values actually do line up with the majority of the residents here. The issues with fentanyl, homelessness, uh, again, as I told you, th this seems to be the issue for a lot of voters, whether they're in Western Washington, Central Washington, or Eastern Washington. They've only increased while you've been in the state Senate. The same argument could be made about Bob as Attorney General. So for the people who view him as status quo and are frustrated by these issues, how should anybody look at you and say, hey, how would it be any different? You've, you've been in the state Senate while these, these problems have increased. So this is why I think is really important. This is why we're excited about the next few months. We think as voters get educated, this is all gonna work in our favor because the Supreme Court, through a decision called the Blake decision, legalized possession of drugs in the state of Washington three years ago. In 2021, our Supreme Court legalized possession of fentanyl in public places. Attorney General Bob Ferguson was the one urging the legislature urging the legislature to follow the path of Oregon and decriminalize possession of drugs like meth, fentanyl, heroin. I was a Democratic state senator that came out the day after that Supreme Court decision and said, I'm dropping a bill to make sure that does not happen in the state of Washington. I have been fighting to make sure we have accountability for public drug use ever since the Blake decision came down in 2021. The person I have been fighting is Attorney General Bob Ferguson. He wanted to go the opposite way. I won the fight. I co-sponsored the bill that we passed last year, Senate Bill 5536, to make sure we have a gross misdemeanor. I actually worked with Republicans and Democrats to get a proposal that is treatment focused and has accountability for public drug use. As voters learn where Attorney General Ferguson and I were on the most important public safety issue facing our state over the last five or six years, it works in my favor. This is why we're optimistic as we head into primary season. You believe that's the biggest Now to Semi Bird, who has taken an unusual path to get to this point, a former Richland School Board member who was recalled by voters for his stance on mask enforcement. The Republican has been criticized for his past record, both in the military and in the courts, yet earned the endorsement of state GOP convention delegates. From where you sit, what the heck happened at the GOP convention? It was great. We made history in terms of having the largest number of delegates ever to attend a convention, right around 2,000, just over 2,000, and the delegate count was around 1,839. And then, well, to be specific, the exciting part would have been when the Washington State Republican Party Candidate Committee um, held a meeting the night before the actual start of the convention, and they decided um, in a vote that they were going to disqualify me. 
And they announced that the next day after the convention started. And as soon as those words came out, the convention uh, delegates, uh, by a majority, voiced their their uh, disposition and, and statement. And the chairman, Jim Walsh, did a masterful job in maintaining order. And people's voices were heard, because that's what Jim did. He says, let's, let's hear what you have to say. And people approached the mic in an orderly fashion, and they shared what they were thinking. And uh, someone made an, uh, an, uh, a motion to amend the report to say, we will restore the convention to its full intent to have both Dave Reichert and Semi Bird on the ballot, and then we would take a vote. That's the fair and equitable thing to do, and that's what it ended up being. And then we won by a supermajority vote of 72% and in a, in a vote of the delegates, and it was wonderful. But it was a good, good experience. Dave Reichert has called it chaos. Yeah. Do you, do you agree that it was chaos? No, not, a, not at all. I mean, it's, it's, imagine the conventions that you see on TV, the national conventions, and it, it's loud and people are either for a candidate, you know, or, you know, maybe not for a candidate. But when that, 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 that report came out, people stood and said, no, you know. And then again, uh, Chairman Walsh said, well, let's, let's voice your thoughts, approach the mic, and that's what they did. So it wasn't chaos, it was passion, it was real, it was just, it was live, and it was free. But it was orderly, and it was quite beautiful. And I will say this, for the delegates who were there to support Dave, they were wonderful as well. They voiced their thoughts and what, what they wanted, and they approached the mic as well. And that's what this is all about. It's, it's not stifling voices or censuring opinions. It's, it's listening and learning and then leaving it up to the people to decide. And that's what happened. And this uh, process they were talking about, again, according to the Reichert campaign, they, they brought up the, the criminal record related to bank larceny, the bankruptcy on your record, that you were once charged with felony theft, that all of that baggage should exclude you from getting the nomination. How do you answer to those those past convictions, the, the past bankruptcy? So quantitatively and the smoke and mirrors of just even to say convictions, when you when you hear that and you lay it out, just that sounds like, oh my gosh, this guy, he has a he has a what do they call it, a rap sheet. I have one conviction for a misdemeanor, which is wrong. Uh, guilty for charge, you're convicted for a reason. And when you say bank larceny, there was no theft of money. No money is taken. It was a credit line of $1,800. I used my father's credit. It was wrong. I could say that a million more times. My father forgave me. He loved me. He found Christ. There was a bitterness that drove that action. I'm not justifying it. But the beauty in all this was that he forgave me and came back into my life after decades of being apart. And at the end of the day, I was his, the executor of his, of his estate, and he he passed away proud of his son. But one conviction, 31 years ago, criteria of the background check for all candidates, Dave included, 15 years, have you ever had a felony? Semi Bird, no, I never had a felony in my entire life. So let's get that clear. Bankruptcy within the last 50 year, 15 years. Have you ever had a bankruptcy in the last 15 years? No. I have an 818 credit score, zero judgments, zero collections. It's perfect credit. I passed every aspect of the background investigation as per their criteria, but the Reichert campaign and their action group, Restore Washington, has been targeting me. One of their largest donors, Steve Gordon, paid for a website dedicated to slander and libel against myself and my family. And that's what you're seeing. And now Dave Reichert is actually using those talking points. And he's resorted to calling names. Semi Bird is a crook. He's a snake oil salesman. And when I was asked by another reporter, how do I respond to that? I said, well, I've always referred to Dave as a gentleman. And I would hope that at some point in time, he would find that again, because I will never lower myself to calling names to another candidate or anybody else for that matter. The truth is there for the people to see it. But there's a lot of people in this city and in a lot of communities that may have had problems in their past. And this governor candidate and this future governor will not label a person as something bad for the rest of their life. Redemption, forgiveness. People who want to move on and better themselves in Washington state should always have a pathway. 
That's what I'll represent, and I have the experience to do so because I've lived it. Maybe not in prison, maybe not with addiction, maybe not as a felon or a convict, but even that misdemeanor gives me the compassion and understanding and empathy that we must always give a person a pathway for forgiveness and a second chance. When did you make that decision though that you wanted to be uh, hold a state office? Was it during the pandemic? Was it before the pandemic? Um, I would say during towards the end. I and my wife, because we do everything together, she's my life, we had never had anything political. Um, it would be quite the opposite. Um, respect to our politicians. Um, I'm not a career politician, nor do I ever want to be one. This is literally, I feel, is a calling to serve, again, something important. And as I said before, greater than myself. Um, I saw it. I saw it with the lockdowns, the mandates, the restrictions, the devastation of our economy, the, the discourse uh, along racial lines, uh, along societal lines. And I said, we must be better. We must be better, we must do better. And if not, again, us who, if not now, when, as they say. But we need someone to represent the community, diverse communities, not more of the same, not the political elite, and not the donor class. We need someone to represent us, we the people. And I said, well, I'm gonna do it because I'm not gonna run away from my state that I love and where I was raised. That was the choice and here I am. It's interesting you talked about the mandates uh, because I think some people have seen headlines, the fact that you were on the Richland School Board, that you had voted the way you did regarding mask mandates. You were later recalled for that. You have since said that you wear that recall like a badge of honor. Why do you wear that like a badge of honor? Yeah, we had the highest suicide rate of our children and our students. A mandate's not a law. I didn't make that decision or that motion for political reasons, and I stated that when I made the motion. It was to protect our children. Would you campaign with the former president, Donald Trump? You know, I, I paused just a little bit on that because I'm here to serve Washington and Washington citizens. It's not a political endeavor for me. It's not about politics. It's about putting people over politics. It's not to say that I don't support this or that or this person or that person. President Trump brought forward good policies in terms of border security, opportunity zones and minority communities, supporting black education, bringing economic prosperity, energy independence. Those are things I support. I support also civility. I also support leading and leadership qualities, which is not to call names which is not to, to label individuals or take the offensive when there's no need to take an offensive. So I am my own man, I am my own person. I am a faith-based person, which calls for love at all turns, and that's how I wanna be defined. So I focus on Washington State and the citizens of our state, but I will campaign with leaders of our communities, black, brown, and all. That's who I will campaign with to lead ourselves to equality and prosperity. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but based on what you just said, I mean, I've, I've heard people label you as the MAGA candidate. Yeah. That sounds like you're distancing yourself from the former president as you go on the campaign trail. Yeah, it's, it's not a distancing, it's a focus. And, and again, one has nothing to do with the other. I'm running for governor of Washington State, which has nothing to do with the president of the United States. We're in the northwest corner of the nation. Washington State is on the other side of the nation. That's the problem. We should be focusing on what's best for Washington and the citizens of Washington. So no distance in intended. And, and I will say very clearly, and I, I was asked by an, another large media group, well, who are you voting for? And I said, President Donald Trump. Um, why? Because I like his policies. And I don't necessarily agree with his communication style or his leadership style. But border security, energy independence, all those things, yes. Okay, so the issues in Washington State, as you know, that are most important to people, at the top of that list is the homelessness crisis. Yes. Uh, that has been routinely over the last few years been the top issue for people in Washington State. On the website, it also says, I will activate our National Guard to bring forward immediate housing, physical, psychological, and dental health services, as you were just talking about, that will include alcohol and drug intervention and treatment. But I can see somebody pulling out of that, saying, 
Well, Semi's going to call for the National Guard to sweep up homeless people. Oh, no. Thank you for that opportunity to clarify. Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. We're not going to have our National Guard soldiers in the streets or anything like that. It's to build the infrastructure because our citizen soldiers, who are amazing and airmen, that's what they do. So do you believe that abortion is settled in Washington state as law? It, it, there is a law, 9.02.100. And there's nothing that you would do to try and change that? No. No, I mean, it's, it's outside of my purview as governor. The governor has no authority uh, to change law of Washington state. That should be set aside for our citizens and those elected uh, legislatures. That's their job. And as far as another issue that came up during the, the GOP convention, voting on the platform, about the idea of abolishing vote by mail and going yeah. back to an old system. Do you believe in, in abolishing vote by mail? I believe in election integrity. I believe that the most effective and efficient way to ensure election integrity is in-person voting. But when you bring in a solution of in-person voting, we must take into consideration our seniors. I talked to a friend the other day and he says, my mother is, is 80 years old and she'll get in line because she's a patriot. And, and she's old school like that. She, there's no reason for her to get in line at that age. So our seniors must be taken into consideration and they should always have that option to mail in their ballot. The same thing with our veterans and our disabled citizens. They should always have that option. But for the rest of us, if it's the most safest, more effective, uh, most uh, secure way to ensure election integrity, which statistically, regardless of party, Democrat, independent or Republican, everyone wants safe, secure, elections. There have been Republicans and Democrats who, who like this system in Washington state. It's, it's worked just fine. Why change anything? What I would say to this as governor, this is not something, a decision that I would make. This would be put to a vote. And I think the citizens of our state should vote on this. Which would be, that vote would be done by mail, ironically. But Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's end with this. Since we talked, Byrd has come under heavy criticism about his military record and whether he wore badges that he did not earn, which he has fiercely denied. Have you lied about your military service? No. Unequivocally, no. No, absolutely. Unequivocally, no. Um, it's, it's a disgusting affront. There's no depth to which we will sink in politics, and that's what we're, while we're talking about it now. We should be talking about policy, solutions, the fact that our great country has, in our great state, has nominated for the first time in state history, the first black candidate for the office of governor of any party. But we won't talk about that. Just for that. Byrd's nomination by state Republicans drew the ire of Dave Reichert, who talked about it with us and more about his campaign goals during that visit in Wenatchee. I think most people are aware of the fact by now that it was a, a chaotic um, convention to say the least. Um, and it was disingenuous, um, dishonest. Uh, everything that happened um, from Friday through, well, actually Thursday, Friday, and Saturday was structured in a way to benefit one candidate, and it wasn't me. And, um, but there were other things leading up to the convention that uh, helped get us to the point on Friday where I finally decided that this was not... Um, this was not a fair process. It was not a, an honest process, which bothered me the most, where I finally decided I had to withdraw from this. It was, it was some called it a, a clown show. Some called it a crap show using a, a different adjective in front of the show. Um, so it was very clear to me um, that uh, I had to remove myself from that. Was it a clown show? Well, yes, <laughs> yes. You know, the, so I, I was arriving. I was told by my staff, this is, this is chaotic. And so I went and stayed someplace else, uh, waiting and talking. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they had a meeting to decide whether or not uh, Mr. Bird would be disqualified um, due to his admissions of a grand larceny and uh, a bank larceny and um, a uh, identity theft charge, which he admitted to. So he was disqualified. From what we're told from someone who was inside that meeting, it was begrudgingly applied, the disqualification. And once it was applied, then the question came up is, well, we can't go out there and say that Dave Reichert is the only candidate. All hell will break loose. So how do you fix public safety? You know this, that 
uh, one of your opponents, Bob Ferguson, has already talked about $100 million, hiring a bunch of new cops statewide. You talked about it this morning about where Washington State stands in, in public safety. So how do you fix it? It's not something that can be fixed overnight. Well, yeah, especially with the way that laws have been rewritten in the last few years um, regarding policies that restrict police officers from actually doing their job. So, yes, they've made a little progress in the pursuit laws, but uh, they're not quite there yet. Uh, they should allow some technology uh, along with some of the laws that we're constructing around pursuit. There is a place in this world to have safe pursuits. Police officers should be able to pursue criminals. I think most people, the majority of people in Washington state would agree to that. With that thought about pursuit policy that really addresses the, the first issue and that is allow police officers to enforce the law. And that means going after the criminals who have just committed the law, especially when you arrive at the scene and the criminals are still there, they ram your police car and you're not allowed to pursue uh, the, the crook. That's ridiculous. It's an upside down world in my opinion. Two other issues are uh, associated with supporting police officers and I think first thing uh, is we have to elect city officials, county officials, local officials that support police officers that understand the need to have community policing. We go back to that old terminology of community policing and working with the community and building trust. I'd really like to change the way that laws are applied when we look at um, the liabilities that police officers take on when they make these split second decisions, life or death decisions. They're worried about getting sued and they're worried about being charged with a crime themselves. And yes, we need to hold cops accountable for bad actions. Cops don't want bad actors within their police department, within the law enforcement community because they make us all look bad. So. You have to combine the um, holding accountable, just as you would a citizen to the law uh, in the state of Washington, holding law enforcement officers accountable to the law also. But you've got to give them some leeway when they make those life and death decisions in an instant. And uh, I shared a story earlier today about my own experience. and it, I have a number of those that I could share. Um, and, and then uh, what, what really bothers me are two additional things, uh, and that is uh, the Burn JAG grant monies have been redirected and taken away from the Burn JAG task force uh, forces here that exist in the state of Washington. So instead of having a steady stream of funding to fund those task force efforts, to arrest those people that are bringing fentanyl in to our communities and people are dying, 21% increase uh, in fentanyl deaths in Washington state over last year, They've taken that money away from enforcement, and that's the whole purpose of that, those federal dollars. They've taken them, uh, them away, and they put them into other services, which that's good to have services, but you've got to have, as you may have heard in our meeting, a three-legged stool. And you've got to have that support of the community. You've got to have enforcement. You've got to have that social services aspect of it. And when they took the burn JAG uh, money away, they only now have funding for one year. So every year now they have to go back and ask for funding to continue the investigation on cartels and gangs. Um, the last thing that I would mention in law enforcement, I have a longer list, but I'll end it with this. We have uh, a system in place through an appointed parole board who have released about 35% of our inmates who have not completed their sentences. There has to be consequences. You have to do the time if you do the crime, the old saying. If you're going to do the crime, you got to do the time. And people need to know that, uh, that are committing crimes in our communities. When I visited small businesses here in Wenatchee, that is the first thing that was mentioned to me, was that the crime in Wenatchee, the crime rate and the feeling of being unsafe. And so I would remove members of the um, parole board, the ISRB. I'd remove those members. And I have personal experiences with cases in the past where they're allowing or want to allow the release of, of people who have murdered more than one person. It's, <laughs> they want to release them from prison. And I know, I know these people, and I know they would kill again. So let's talk about numbers. I think, and this is objectively speaking, a lot of Republicans have looked to you uh, for years to run for governor because of your King County ties, and that's where Republicans have had problems for years in terms of the vote. And I've, I've talked to consultants who 
who talk about this all the time, how tough it is for a Republican to get 40 percent of the vote. You know this, but I'll rattle it off. Donald Trump lost 74 to 22 and 730,000 votes in the last election. Inslee won by nearly 550,000 votes. You beat Tony Ventrella by 13 points in 2016, <laughs> but Jay Inslee won by 35 points, 350,000 votes. Rob McKenna lost by 25 points, 230,000 votes in 2012. Greg War won by nearly 30 points in 2008. Yeah. Republicans have had a butt kick in, in King County for a long time and haven't been able to get over the 40, 40 mark. So why are you the guy to yeah. get over the 40 mark well, in I, King County? Because I've never, take, I've never taken the butt kicking <laughs> that everybody else has taken. So when Obama ran, I won both times. So I've, I've run seven times in Congress, won seven times. And they were tough elections, as everyone knows. And that was in a Democrat district that a Republican won. Why? Because we approach problems based on facts. You have told me what your personal position is. You've also told me that you believe that that issue has been decided in this state. However, there are voters, independent voters, who are still concerned about any sort of change on the state level and a federal ban on abortion. Would you support a federal ban on abortion? No, I'm again focused on Washington State. The Supreme Court has already decided this issue. This is a state's rights issue. Uh, we have had a law in Washington State that was passed in 1970. This is a question that has already been answered in Washington State. So when Bob Ferguson says that the state needs to have somebody who will fight for them if there is a a, a potential change with federal laws and that, that that's why he should be governor, you would answer yeah, that well, he's Yeah, so Bob Ferguson also says Dave Reichert is dangerous for Washington state. Bob is gonna run a, a, a campaign based on fear and based on lies. He's saying things that, that I wouldn't do and never intend to do. That's gonna be the tactic that he has. It's the only tactic he has, is to use fear and lies to paint me in a light that is unfavorable to voters. People know me. I hope they listen to me closely in this interview. I have no intention at all of making any effort toward changing any laws in Washington state regarding abortion. So let's go back to Ferguson. He was a King County Councilman before he was Attorney General, and you've already heard he's getting attacked by the Republicans and a Democrat running against him. We spent some of that time at the Seattle Shrimp Feed talking about his campaign, and it's clear he's gearing up for a fall battle with Riker. Bob, it feels like you've been running for governor for a decade. Why now? It's only been a year. <laughs> it's only been a year. Hey, others put... Uh, put motivations on people, that's never been my thing. So uh, obviously once Governor Inslee decided not to seek a fourth term, you know, it became clear to me if I was going to run for governor, obviously this was the, the time to think about it. So it's, yeah. There are four candidates that seem to be the big four when it comes to the, the governor's race. But for you personally, what are your four top priorities in 24? Yeah, so number one, first thing I think we knew as a state is change the whole state bureaucracy to make sure we're centering the people in the decisions we make and to solve our problems. So there's a zillion issues, right, but no particular order, take public safety. The first plan we rolled out as a campaign, first detailed plan that any candidate put out was on public safety. Focusing on things like I talked about in here to our supporters, Liberty Air, which is we rank last per capita, Washington State does, in number of law enforcement officers we have. But that's unacceptable. I've got a plan to address that. I uh, look forward to seeing our other candidates, what their plans are on that. Number two, homelessness, which gets into a whole range of complex issues, as you and your viewers know. You've got mental health issues, you've got chemical dependency issues, you've got affordability issues. All that come into that umbrella of homelessness. And so as a governor, working with local jurisdictions to make sure we're addressing that will be key. Affordability, again, I've been to all 39 counties. The issue I heard the most in all 39 counties is the cost of housing. Housing jurisdiction after jurisdiction. We need to be investing in more housing, we need to build a million new units of housing in the next 15 to 20 years. And as governor, I'll be very focused on that. So those combination of all those issues will be central um, to my time as governor. And one more I'll add is, I'm not sure I'm number four if I'm on number five, but one more I'll add is, I think as a state, we need to be prepared for the potential of a Donald Trump presidency. And we'll need to have a governor who stands up for the rights of all Washingtonians. I have done that, my opponents have not, and there's a clear contrast in this race on that issue. So I heard homelessness, public safety, housing. Fentanyl epidemic, mental health issues, all those combined together for multiple issues that our state is facing. And look, I always just hesitate on, hey, when the top three, top two, top four, because we haven't even talked about education. Look, I'm the son of, 
My mom's passed away not too long ago. She was a public school special education teacher. But the challenges we have with our education system generally, and some of those specific areas like special education are profound. The number of kids in our state with special needs, the kind of kids my mom was working with year after year after year and talking about over the dinner table with me and my siblings, those challenges are significant. The actual physical structure for school. When I was in Republic, Washington, it's like toured all 39 counties, but the folks in Republic want to talk about was the lack of the structures, the actual infrastructure for their schools and how they need new buildings for the kids in their, in their jurisdiction. So there are multiple challenges we have as a state, but I think what we need as a governor is a change agent, someone who's demonstrating the ability to go in and shake things up. I've certainly done that when I ran for the King County Council, certainly done that as an attorney general, and I don't plan on changing that. Okay, so there, there might be a change agent needed when it comes to homelessness. Washington State, uh, as you know, HUD in their latest point in time count says Washington State has the fourth most people living unsheltered, homeless people of any state in the nation. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of issues with state right of ways. The, the state has made some progress there, but it's still a problem. These are areas where there's a lot of encampments, a lot of crime that's been associated with them. So what's the big idea? How do you fix homelessness? When I talk to folks all across the state is you know, as attorney general, I could see a problem. I could file a lawsuit and often get a decision from a judge in a matter of weeks that stopped that problem, right? I'm aware that being governor is a different kind of job. Issues like homelessness, the fentanyl epidemic, right? Public safety, these are challenging issues. You're not gonna solve them overnight. But I think what we need is a change in approach from the state perspective. Someone who comes in as a change agent and is going to focus on these issues. So when it comes to homelessness, look, when I was on King County Council, I spent a night at an emergency shelter. Went in, spent the night there to get a feel for what's going on at the ground level. The people ride those services, the folks who are staying in those emergency services, utilizing those emergency services. As a governor, we need to make sure we're working to address the underlying causes of homelessness. Look, Dave Reichert, he has said he would take the unhoused and send them to McNeil Island. That's where we keep our sexually violent predators. I know that because my team sends those folks there. I'm sorry, that is not a serious solution to an issue as serious as homelessness. What we need is our investments that are smart, that get folks in temporary housing, get them off the streets, get them the wraparound services that they need to address the underlying issues that are creating the situation in which they're homeless. We've talked about those, mental health, chemical dependency, housing affordability. The good news is, as Attorney General, I've addressed those. My team's brought in more than a billion dollars from the opioid epidemic, taking on the largest corporations in the world. I'm insisting that every one of those dollars be used in jurisdictions all around the state for more treatment for more first responders to help. That's what we need, smart investments to help folks who are on the streets, not saying that to McNeil Island like Dave Riker wants to do. Mark Mullet and others have pointed out, independents and Republicans in particular, that you wanted to decriminalize drugs in 2021, that you wanted to eliminate the criminal penalties for non-commercial possession. Oregon did it. Yep. It was chaotic. Yeah. Do you still believe that Washington should do? Oh, no. Look, I long ago said that should not be our approach. And you're right, Oregon, what is an Oregon pass it like with 55 or 56 percent of the vote? And there are lessons to be learned from that, right? It seemed to the folks of Oregon that was a good idea. Clearly did not work. And I'm proud that, hey, to be clear, I've always supported criminal penalties for dealers. Always for going after companies that fuel our opioid epidemic. We talked about that earlier. Um, making sure that folks are not using open use of drugs on our streets. And I'm proud that the money we brought in from those cases for treatment were critical in the legislature recently passing legislation that criminalized that conduct. And many legislators said, hey, we want to see the treatment as well, right? We're not going to prosecute our way out of this. We need to have treatment for folks as well. And that $1.3 billion that my team has brought to the state is going to play a huge role in making sure we address that in the right way. This is a public health issue as well, right? Folks need to be held accountable for their actions, but we also I get folks to treatment. Otherwise, we're simply recycling folks to the system. So you do not want to decriminalize drugs anymore? I support the legislature's actions long ago to take that action. That's been public, that's been out there for a long time. I, I get that. One of my opponents who's polling at 4% wants to relitigate things in the past. Uh, you know, M M Mark needs to be accountable for his vote to limit police pursuits. So a couple of the plans you've already put on your website, uh, $100 million in grants for additional yeah. troopers and local law enforcement agencies. How is that supposed to work? I mean, we've seen the shortage across the country of people who actually want to be in law enforcement. We've seen a shortage in the state patrol, a shortage in, yeah. in the Seattle Police Department in particular. So how is this supposed to change the course of staffing in these departments? Well, it will change by adding additional resources to salary and signing bonuses 
to attract individuals to come to Washington State or to pursue going into law enforcement because they realize, hey, there's additional salary, there's more resources for that. That helps me afford a house. That helps me afford my groceries, right? I think that is natural. Why Dave Reichert suppose that? You'd have to ask him. But we've seen other governors across the state take precisely that step, Democrats and Republicans. That makes sense to me. You know, we think as a state, we want to make sure we are providing a fair wage and a good wage for folks who do the most important work, educators, law enforcement. And I think when you have a crisis, as we do, with the lack of law, for, law enforcement officers, that seems to me the type of issue you lean into as a governor and lean into with your budget to do what you can. I'm open to additional ideas as well, uh, but what I've seen from Dave Reichert and law enforcement officers should know this, he's opposed to it. I think they deserve the greater salary. I think there should be signing bonuses. I think more resources should be available to local jurisdictions that often don't have much of a budget, right, to expand on that and to attract those law enforcement officers. So to me, it's a good idea, and I plan on proposing my first budget. On the Carbon Commitment Act, the biggest complaint has been the price of gas. Absolutely. And uh, I've heard Mark Mullet say, hey, we need to tweak it. Yes. Uh, I've heard others say, repeal the whole thing. Yes. Uh, where do you stand on that yep. if, if, if once we get past November and if you're elected governor? Yep. So I've been clear on this needs to be adjusted. You heard me in there talking about the issue of affordability I heard all across the state around housing and on gas prices. And folks are feeling that. And so the good news is with the Climate Commitment Act, it makes significant contributions to a working family's tax credit. We should expand the investment of the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars the Climate Commitment Act brings in to increase the amount of funding we have for that working, fam working family's tax credit, which to your point, addresses folks who are hardest hit by those gas prices. That to me is an example of a change that needs to be made. You know, there are people who uh, will argue that it's a continuation of the Inslee administration uh, if yeah. you're elected. So yeah. how, do you, how do you convince people it's not, you're just not the status quo guy? Yeah, I think all folks have to do is look at my record, right? When I first ran for the King County Council in this neighborhood, I ran against a 20 year incumbent who was a Democrat like me, who was chair of the King County Council. You can't take on the establishment any more than that in what happens to be a deeply democratic part of our state. I'm different than Chris Gregoire or different than Jay Inslee or different than Gary Locke. We're different people. Um, but the key thing is, I do think we have values as a state. You know, Dave Reichert's anti-choice. You know, I do not think that's gonna play well with the overwhelming majority of Washingtonians. He opposes marriage equality. I think that's out of step with the majority of Washingtonians. He voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act 37 times, out of touch. He voted with the Trump agenda 93% of the time, out of touch. So the contrast with myself and Dave Reichert, and that's where this campaign's going, by the way, me versus Dave Reichert in November. Well, he still has to get through the primary first on August the 6th before we start talking about the election in November. But thank you to all of the candidates for spending the time with us and to you as well. This has been a special edition of Beyond the Podium, the race for governor. I'm Chris Daniels. We'll see you soon online and on the air.